Hi, I'm Paul Marston, and I'm going to do a short series for my church, King's Church, Free Methodist Church, <coughs> for Easter. And the first three are based on particular people involved in the events of Easter itself. And obviously this gives you a clue who we're going to start with. So um, I'm just going to switch to full screen, uh, but then you won't see me, which is no great loss, and I might pop back at the end. So this is who we are going to look at. So meet Simon Johnson. He was introduced to Jesus by his brother Andrew and Jesus gave him a nickname. Well, actually, our hero had the Aramaic name Simeon, but he apparently preferred to use the Greek name Simon. In Jesus' terms, he was son of Jonah or John, so his name would be Simon Johnson. John says that his brother Andrew had been a disciple of John the Baptist. He'd heard John the Baptist say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Andrew spent a day with Jesus and at the end went to Simon, his brother, and said, we found the Messiah. What do we know about uh, Simon's background and character? Well, Jesus looked at him and recognised his name as Simon Johnson but he nicknamed him Rocky. So I've given you a bit of a clue about that really there. But uh, of course, he probably looked something a bit more like that. In Aramaic, this is uh, Kephra or Cephas, and the Greek word for rock or stone is Petros or Petra. Jesus may have been praying even then about who to make his emissaries, his messengers. And he, he meets uh, Nathaniel, and says, for example, behold an Israelite in whom there's nothing false. So he has a, a good idea about the people that he's meeting and calling to be disciples. Well, we also know that uh, Simon uh, or Rocky um, came from Bethsaida, a fishing village on Galilee. We don't know the exact site. Um, he had a home in another fishing village, Capernaum, with his family and with Andrew his brother, which Jesus made an early base in his ministry, Mark 1.21 says this. He was a fisherman who owned his own boat, boat and partnered with Andrew and also with James and John in their boat, uh, which was a separate one. And early in his ministry, as I said, <coughs> Jesus made a home of Simon and Andrew, his base. In 1986, as Galilee shrank in a drought, the remains of a first century fishing boat were uncovered. There was no particular reason to connect it to Peter, but it was from the first century and it was 27 feet or 8.27 meters long and seven and a half feet wide with a maximum preserved height of 4.3 feet. Now, remember this when you think about being in a ferocious storm on Galilee. OK, what else do we know? Well, we know that Peter was married uh, and early on Jesus healed his mother-in-law in Mark 130, Luke 4, 38, 41. In his later days in missionary work, 1 Corinthians 9, 5 says his wife seems to have accompanied him at least some of the time. He had a strong Galilean country accent and was not highly educated. People from Jerusalem, the capital, tended to look down on the country folk from Galilee. And in Acts 4, 13, it says that when they saw the boldness of Peter, and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognised they'd been with Jesus. We should remember, though, that in their culture, being a manual worker was not looked down on. The highly educated Saul or Paul, who'd sat at the feet of a leading rabbi, Gamaliel, was a tent maker. What counted was being learned in the Jewish law and traditions of the elders. And incidentally, scholars say that the Greek in his later letters was not very elegant. So uh, bear that in mind. Peter was an impulsive man, often blundering in or over promising, overconfident in his own judgment. We see this, for example, at the Transfiguration or when he rebuked Jesus for saying he would die or when he protested vehemently, he would never deny Jesus. Yet Jesus did choose him as a leader, and it's Peter, James and John who were the three central followers in Jesus' inner circle. 
Peter returns to fishing even after Jesus calls him and again even after the resurrection. Maybe this is why Jesus softens the blow. No longer is he to be a fisherman for fish, but a fisherman of men. Of course, the word men is not particularly gender specific in that language. It just means people. So he was having a different calling from God. And his disciple, called a disciple, came in stages. When he first met Jesus, Simon became a follower and got the nickname Rocky. But he didn't give up his day job. He may well have gone around at times with Jesus and witnessed his healing and, and healings and teaching. Uh, but then Mark and Matthew describe this. This is a description of a calling. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, come after me and I will make you to become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them immediately. They left the boats and their poor old dad and followed him. Now, this certainly wasn't the first time he'd met them. For one thing, James and John were his cousins. So it seems highly unlikely he wouldn't have met them before, especially as they both lived in, they all lived in Nazareth. So uh, this isn't some sort of a completely out of the blue th thing. Um, but <clears throat> it looks pretty straightforward. He saw them fishing, mending and so on and called them. They left the jobs following him full time. But the problem is, how do we reconcile this with the account in Luke? Because in Luke 4, Jesus is preaching around Simon's home in Capernaum and goes to stay with him sometimes. Then he goes south to preach in Judea. Returning in Luke 5, he uses Simon's boat to preach to people on shore. OK, Simon and Andrew had caught nothing all night. Actually, fish apparently in Galilee come nearer the surface at night and can be caught more easily. But Jesus tells them to try now, sometime near midday to chuck the net in again and they make a huge catch and this is overwhelming to peter who who, who comes out and says depart from me i'm a sinful man of god and and he realizes who he who jesus really is he's something a bit more than just simply a, a healer and a prophet and jesus is really saying look i can sort out you making your living um, but i want you to be catching people not fish now, how does this tie in with Matthew and Mark's accounts? Well, either there were two separate incidences, or as I tend to think, Matthew and Mark just pray see the events. And uh, actually, Luke is giving the fuller form of what happened. Well, Jesus, of course, had many disciples and followers. But then in Mark 3, it says he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles or messengers or ambassadors, that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. They were acting on his behalf. This was his core team and Simon is always named first. There is often explicit confusion over Jesus' later words in John 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. You should go and bear fruit and the fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. Now, Jesus doesn't mean that he forced them to repent and believe. It doesn't mean that he decides who's going to be Christians and who isn't. He died for the sins of the world. But John 3.16 goes on to whoever puts his faith in him should have eternal life. He didn't decide that they were going to be believers, but he did choose them to be apostles. This is quite important because as Christians, we cannot choose what role God wants us for in his church. We can only choose whether to fulfill that role in the power of the Holy Spirit or to reject it. So, for example, in the Old Testament, Saul was called and chosen, selected, anointed, given a new heart by God to be king. But he he went away from it. He sinned. He turned his back on it and he lost that uh, that appointment. It was given instead to David. Judas was called and chosen as an apostle. And in Acts 2, the apostles noted that Judas had forfeited his ministry and they appointed Matthias in his place. 
it had to be somebody who, uh, like them, had seen Jesus throughout his ministry. Of course, there were many such. They were just saying, OK, Matthias, we're going to, through God's selection, add you to the twelve. And he's afterwards regarded as part of the twelve. So Judas was chosen and, as an apostle just as much as Peter, but um, he, uh, he forfeited that ministry he chose not to fulfill it and we do have that choice to not to fulfill what God calls us to. Then Jesus sent out the twelve. He gave them the right and power over demons and to heal disease. They were to go mainly to the lost sheep of Israel and rely on people's hospitality so don't pack a big bag. But he warned them that often there was going to be trouble. Even though there were trouble the Holy Spirit would speak through them so they don't need to worry about it in advance uh, that God will give them the words to say this is in Luke 9 but in more detail in Matthew 10 well the disciples came back um, and Jesus took them off to Bethsaida for a rest there however the people followed and he fed 5,000 people as we know with a couple of fish and some loaves Shortly after this, the disciples were crossing the lake when they saw a figure moving across the water. They were scared, but Jesus called out to them not to be afraid. And of course, Peter, as usual at the front, says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. They thought maybe it was a ghost and Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw Well, the lessons of this are so obvious. You must have heard them before. Jesus was not sure it was sorry. Peter was not sure it was Jesus. <clears throat> he could have worried about the laughter of his mates in the boat if he sank. Um, or he could have feared the storm or the wind. But the problem is, if you want to walk on the water, you have to get out of the boat. There isn't a halfway. He couldn't put one foot out and see how that got on. He either got out or he didn't get out. And in the end, he did get out. Well, OK, it didn't work too well and he sank. But he cried out, Lord, save me. And of course, Jesus did. When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you're the son of God. Now, if it's shortly after this that Jesus asked them who people thought he was. And they said, well, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're John the Baptist. Come back. Some say this. Some say that. And then, of course, he asked the big question. Who do you think that I am? Simon Peter said, <clears throat> you are the Messiah, the son of living God. Now, remember, they'd all just seen him feed 5000 and walk across the water in a storm. And then he says, who do you think I am? Peter had heard God himself with James and John, had God himself say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then uh, listen to him in the transfiguration. So Simon Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And uh, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because you did not learn this from man. My father in heaven has shown you this. And I tell you that you are Petra on this rock. Petros, I will build my church. The powers of hell will not be able to have power over my church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The church, of course, is not built on Simon Peter, but on Simon's recognition of who Jesus is. This knowledge is the key for people to enter the kingdom. Simon, who maybe now we can call Peter, and Mark starts calling him that here, used the key in Acts 2 to open the kingdom to Jews when he proclaimed God had made Jesus both Lord and and Messiah. In Acts 9, Peter used the keys to open the kingdom to the devout praying Roman Cornelius, preaching good news of peace by Jesus the Messiah, the Lord of all. So that's when he used the keys, but of course now that we know who Jesus is, we have the keys to the kingdom of heaven, we can open it to other people. Well, Peter was still self-opinionated and impetuous. Jesus began to explain how he would suffer and die. And Peter said, never, Lord, this mustn't happen to you. And then he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're standing in my way. You're not thinking how God thinks. You're thinking how man thinks. Satan, of course, means opponent. It doesn't mean he was the devil. 
Peter was unwittingly opposing what God intended. We should all beware when we have strong opinions about actions that we're not thinking how man thinks and not how God thinks. Six days later was what we call the transfiguration. Peter, James and John were with him. His face was as bright as the sun, his clothes looked as white as light. Moses and Elijah were seen talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you will let us, we will build three altars here. One will be for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Moses represented the law and Elijah the prophets and Jesus would fulfill both. Good old blunder in thieves, Peter, though. Let's build a monument, he says. Christians love building monuments. It gives a kind of feeling of permanence, like a church building. Better still, I would actually like someone to build a Paul Marstall Memorial Church with a cabinet at the front with all my books in. Well, well it's not too likely. Uh, but in any case, memorials decay or are forgotten and church buildings are converted to mosques, whether in Preston or in Istanbul. So we can't get permanence by building, um, you know, buildings. But anyway, um, don't fret, Pete, because the Greek or Orthodox and the Franciscans are both on the case. Both of these have been built on Mount Tabor, where the Transfiguration is believed to have happened. One's Greek Orthodox and the other is Francis Franciscan. So it's very um, it's very built into human nature that we want to build monuments to things. Years later, in 2 Peter 1.16, Peter remembers this great occasion. It's not just, he says, some cleverly designed myth. We saw the scene on Mount Tobor. We saw his glory. Well, we come now to what's least at the Last Supper. The Last Supper was not a, a Passover meal. Nothing distinctive says it was. Matthew and Mark both say it was the day of preparation. And John is quite explicit. It was the day of preparation for or the Passover. He says it twice in 1914 and 31. John 9.28 also implies they hadn't eaten, sorry, John 19.28 also implies they hadn't eaten the Passover. And in Luke, Jesus says he really wanted to eat the Passover before he suffered, but <clears throat> the implication that he actually has just eaten it with them has to be inferred from the small word for or gar. But I cannot conceive how it could have been a Passover meal. There's nothing distinctive. He doesn't mention the lamb, which is the lamb of God, and it's on the table in front of him. And then all of this, all of the uh, Gospels say it's the day of preparation, not the Passover day. Anyway, the disciples are quarrelling about who's the greatest of them. And Jesus goes to wash their feet. But Peter says, no, he wants all of him washed. And then Jesus said, well, you don't need to have all of you washed. It's just to wash off the dirt you get going through the world. But you have been cleansed. So Jesus washes their feet anyway. This is not some kind of showy ritual, but to teach them what kind of thing the kingdom was. If it's done now, it's just a pure ritual. It means nothing in our society. But then it did mean something. And it's to show them that in the kingdom, the greatest is the servant. So anyway, they reclined to eat the meal together. Um, they didn't, of course, sit round the table, as uh, uh, various painters have shown. They would recline and uh, lean on their left elbow on the table. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then Jesus drops a bombshell. Uh, one of you, he says, would is going to betray me. Have you ever been in a group with a very clear vision of where you're going and suddenly your strong inspirational leader seems to lose direction and purpose. It leaves you feeling disorientated, unsure of who you are. Sometimes it may turn out that a leader turns out to be flawed in a financial or sexual way. Um, it's too often. Sometimes a leader may disappear into fantasy, um, you know, uh, just believe in QAnon or something, but sometimes they may appear just to lose their drive or vision or sense of identity. Actually, recently we watched that classic intellectual film, Kung Fu Panda, and when he loses his sense of identity, the whole team falls 
part. <clears throat> now, Jesus hadn't lost his sense of identity at all. In fact, it was his vision to fulfill that identity. He come to die for the sins of the world, so he predicts they will desert him. By implication, he will die, but then he will rise again and go before them to Galilee. Actually, the disciples don't seem to pick up on this last point. Peter, in particular, who, by the way, is the main source of Mark's gospel, solely protests that he will never deny Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus says, um, Simon, Simon, listen, Satan's demanded to sift all of you like we. I pray for you, your faith will not fail. You, when once you turn up, strengthen your brothers. And then the bravado of Peter. I'm ready to go to prison and to death. And of course, Jesus says, well, before cockcrow next morning, you'll have denied me three times, actually. Three times, not just once. Now, we used to have a neighbour who kept a cockcrow in a garden and you could indeed, he indeed hear it crowing early in the morning. The disciples are all emotionally exhausted. They don't even take up the mysterious statement that Jesus will be raised up again and go ahead of them to Galilee. This is actually a part of human nature that sometimes people don't hear things if they don't understand them or they don't want to hear them they didn't want to hear that their strong powerful leader who could walk water on water walk on water produce fish out of nowhere etc etc is going to die um, at the hands of people who are his enemies they don't want to hear it so they don't understand it they don't hear it which is a bit sad okay um well, Jesus and his disciples, uh, well, I've said here, yes, Peter is desperate to know who the betrayer is. And he gets John to uh, ask, who's close to Jesus, to ask. John was Jesus' cousin. He always refers to himself as a disciple Jesus loved. Of course, Jesus loved all of them, but he loved John in particular as a close relative. And Jesus gives to John the signal that it's Judas who is going to betray and Judas leaves because it's the day of preparation not the day of the Passover they think he's gone off to buy something for the Passover meal that evening anyway a rather confused conversation follows Peter puzzled as to where Jesus is going protests again that he will die for him <coughs> and again Jesus predicts that before next morning Peter will have denied him three times so after this long conversation recorded in John, Jesus and his 11 disciples go out to Gethsemane to pray. And Jesus, it says elsewhere, often went there to pray and he, he knew that Jesus will know where to find him with the soldiers. So at the end of the meal, he sings a hymn with them and then they leave to go to this olive grove called Gethsemane, which is south of Jerusalem. Some versions call it a garden, but the word garden is a funny word. <clears throat> when my wife Janice first went to China, she read about some famous gardens and was keen to get there and see all the flowers as you would in an English garden. What we found was bushes, rocks, water and lots of highly coloured fish, but very few or no flowers. Well, when we visited the Garden of Gethsemane in 1975, it had some very old twisted olive trees, but it was full of flowers. Next to it, however, was a young olive grove with no flowers, and this is what the Garden of Gethsemane would have looked like in the first century. And I've given you kind of picture there of it in the dark, because remember, they were going out in the dark. Very exhausted. <clears throat> it's been a long day, but also they're emotionally exhausted. They're tired, confused, lost. What on earth is Jesus on about? He's going to die, but he's the Messiah. He's surely going to become the conquering king. Three times Jesus takes aside Peter, James and John to pour out his soul in prayer and three times they fall asleep, bless them. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is indeed weak. Well, of course, we get the drama then. Jesus arrives with the temple guard. They're not Roman soldiers, they're temple guard. And Mark discreetly says, a bystander cut off one of the soldiers' ears with a sword. Well, Mark's writing Peter's story and he discreetly omits to sell us. As John tells us, it was Simon Peter and the man's name was Malchus. And John, who was known to the high priest and his household, um, knew, knew the man, knew who he was. But Jesus forbids them to fight. If you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. And <coughs> Luke tells us that 
Jesus actually touched the man's ear and healed him, the man who was coming to arrest him. Jesus was taken to the house of the high priest in Jerusalem. Peter and John followed at a distance. Now John was known to the people in the house, so he went into the courtyard. Then he realised that Peter was left outside, so he went back to the doorkeeper to get him let in. But the servant girl, they didn't have a big bounce, so they had a servant girl watching the door, said to Peter, aren't you one of the man's disciples? I am not, he answered. It was cold. And Peter joined the soldiers around a charcoal fire to keep warm. Maybe after some time has passed, John tells us, Simon Peter was still standing warming himself so they asked him are you also one of his disciples he denied and said i am not <clears throat> about an hour later one of the high priest's servants a relative of the man whose ear peter had cut off uh, asked didn't i see you with him in the garden your accent shows you're from galilee peter denied it once more and immediately a cockerel crowed well of course at this point uh, Luke implies that um, Jesus was being led across the courtyard, probably being taken to Caiaphas and the full Jewish court. <clears throat> and the Lord turned and looked at Peter and remembered what Jesus had said to him. Did, people re did Peter remember it as he was making the denials? Well, probably not. He was shell-shocked, unable to process all that had happened to him. And so... Uh, Maybe it just struck him when he saw that look and Jesus was saying, well, I did say you do that. And he went out and wept bitterly. We actually hear no more of Peter during the trials and the uh, execution of Jesus. Peter was a broken man. His dreams were shattered, his self-identity destroyed. After all his bluster, he denied being a follower of Jesus. His whole world had collapsed. He went back to the Jerusalem home of his friend John, being joined there later by John himself, who'd stayed to see the crucifixion, by John's mother, Salome. That's not the one that danced for Herod, it's a different Salome. And also Mary, who was the mother of Jesus and was Salome's sister. Um, John was Jesus' cousin. His mum, Salome, and Jesus' mother, Mary, were sisters. So the Passover day finished, followed possibly by another Saturday Sabbath day when no work could be done. That would explain the three days, but it's not certain. The Sunday actually starts at sunset uh, and the Monday also starts at sunset. So very early the next morning, uh, if it was a day after the Sabbath, the Sunday, um, Mary Magdalene and another Mary, who were Jesus' aunt, I believe, arrived from Bethany about a mile and a half away. Well, Jesus had died in the late afternoon, had been hurriedly put in a tomb because Passover day started that evening. So the two uh, intellectual uh, rabbis, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus alone, were able to go to Pilate. They had the clout to get the body and they went and quickly anointed it with a few spices and put it in a tomb <clears throat> because Passover day was starting and they couldn't, they'd already defiled themselves. They wouldn't be able to eat the Passover, but they uh, they couldn't touch a dead body on Passover day. So the proper anointing of the body needed to be done. Uh, their practice would be to leave the body <clears throat> anointed in the tomb roll a big flat stone across the front and then when the body rotted they would take the bones and put them in a the bone casket that was what was intended but early in the morning probably after the two sabbaths then the passover normal sabbath salome mary jesus aunt and mary magdalene set out the the this this there was loads of mary's i'm afraid um, the second mary was jesus aunt on his paternal side and uh she also went, so there were two Marys and a Salome who went out uh, en route. They seem to have met Joanna. Joanna was the wife of Herod Steward Chooser and would have been staying at the palace. And Susanna, we don't know where they met, but there was a gang of women 
eventually that went towards the tomb to anoint the body. So obviously, um, John would have, and Peter would have seen them set out. Very sad. The men hadn't even got the heart to go. They were just lamenting. Peter's probably still crying quite a bit. And the women go out to anoint the body. They don't expect anything to happen. And then they hear a furious knocking at the door. Who was it? Was it soldiers come to arrest the men? It could be. Uh, yeah, the Sabbaths were finished. They could be arrested. Who could it be? So maybe they were a bit nervous and Peter, strong Peter, went with John to the door to find out. They opened it and there stood Mary Magdalene, panting, flushed from one hardly able to gasp out her message when she said they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. And uh, this was an absolute bombshell. Um, what were they to make of it? Well, they didn't know. <laughs> Not really even stopping maybe to think. Perhaps they glanced at each other. Peter and John rushed together from the t to the tomb. Well, John being younger got there first. <clears throat> Remember, Peter was a married man and was probably a bit older, maybe been 30, John maybe 20. And we know John lived a long time afterwards, so he's probably very young at this time. And they got there and they saw the large flat stone had been rolled back. That's what Mary Magdalene had seen when she rang back to tell them. John stood outside, but Peter went in. And there were the grave clothes intact, but with no body. The cloth that had been round Jesus' head was rolled up, lying separately from the linen cloths. Um, couldn't have been grave robbers. They wouldn't take the body and leave the clothes. They'd take the clothes and leave the body. So at that point, John believed. But what was in the mind of Peter? Well, we don't really know. Resurrection was so alien to their way of thinking that even when Mary Magdalene came back later and claimed to have seen Jesus, the disciples, maybe excluding John, disbelieved her. They just didn't know what to make of it. Well, OK. We find then that the Lord, of course, appeared individually to Peter, we're told, and then later in the locked room when he was with first just nine and then all ten remaining disciples. And I'm sure there were other people there, not just the disciples. There'd be women there as well. Uh, his followers would have seen him and seen the marks of the nails in his hands and so on. Well, <clears throat> they'd been told to go to Galilee and wait for him. But Peter, as always, was restless. Peter always was a man of action. He couldn't stand sitting around waiting for something to happen. So he says, right, he says, I'm going fishing. And uh, all night they call nothing. Does that sound familiar? Um, sounds a bit like a time when Jesus first called him. Anyway, in the morning, they saw a figure on the shore who called out to them, cast the net the other side. Now, they, night is the time to fish. And also, fishermen know where you put the net so that the shadow of the boat doesn't cause a problem for the fish. Uh, so cast it on the other. What's he talking about? <clears throat> and guess what? Well, um, Jesus, of course it is, and he has a charcoal fire. He doesn't need their fish. They have a huge catch, of course. And uh, interesting, because it was around a, a charcoal fire that Peter had denied Jesus. And now Jesus is sitting there with a charcoal fire. Well, um, when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. He doesn't say Peter. He says, Simon Johnson, do you love me more than these? Now, we've got an interesting question of what did he mean by these? <coughs> Many commentators take it to mean these are the disciples. But Jesus never, ever encouraged them to, to see who was the greatest or who loved him the most. It's not a who loves Jesus the most competition in the church. Is God going to go to Pastor Kevin and ask him tomorrow, do you love me more than Paul Marston does? Well, I doubt it because it seems to go against everything Jesus has said. 
and Paul later said too about esteeming others better than oneself. So surely what Jesus meant was these fish. OK, and uh, it was a miraculous catch that first led Simon Johnson to leave fishing and follow Jesus full time to become a fisher of people. Now Jesus has to repeat almost the same lesson. Many of us may have something, a profession, a hobby, an activity, not wrong in itself, but not to be placed above the call of God for what he wants us to do in his church. And that seems to have been Peter's problem. <clears throat> what do you love the most, Peter? Is it fishing or is it me and working for the kingdom of God? Now, the other thing that's interesting is that um, John records Peter asks three questions. In English translations, they look the same, but they're not in the Greek language. We don't know, of course, what the words were in Aramaic, but we can only go on the Greek that's given us to give us the sense. So Peter asks him, uh, sorry, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me more than these fish? The word Jesus used for love was agape. You see, I missed an accent off it, never mind. This was the kind of self-sacrificial love which Peter, Peter had boasted effectively would lead him to die for Jesus. So do you really have that kind of extreme agape, self-sacrificing love for me, Peter? Do you love me with that love more than you love these fish? What's your real passion? Well, Peter replies, Jesus, you know that I'm fond of you. But the word Peter uses is not agape, but philo. It's his brotherly love. It's where the word Philadelphia comes from, brotherly love. Um, and uh, so it, there is a subtlety there which isn't there in the translations. The same question by Jesus, an answer from Peter, is then repeated. <clears throat> but this time, not more than these fish. He just says, do you love me? Do you really love me? And again, he says, well, you know, I'm fond of you. The third time Jesus drops his question, he now says, do you have brotherly love for me? Philo for me? Peter replies, you know everything. You know I have this brotherly love. And uh, <clears throat> this has really got several sort of layers to it. Um, one is that uh, Jesus knew that Peter was going to deny him. Peter recognised that Jesus had known that Peter didn't have that extreme agape love. Uh, and uh, he knew that. But Peter also thinks, well, <clears throat> because you know everything, you know, I do have this fondness. I do have this brotherly love for you. And uh, Jesus, well, um, Jesus asked just at that level and Jesus apparently is prepared to accept that as enough. And he gives him three times the uh, the order to feed my sheep, feed my lamb. So what's all this about? Well, there's three affirmations to cancel out three denials. Yes. But note that Peter's bravado is lost. The agape love would lead him to die for Jesus. No, it's a lesser claim. And finally, Jesus takes it. OK. Brotherly love, at least then. Jesus also knows and prophesies that one day Peter will indeed give his life for Jesus in martyrdom, as we believe later being crucified in Rome. And of course, he tells Peter to feed his flock. Well, Luke records um, Peter's final sight of the risen Jesus. He'd given a commission, of course, to go in all the world to preach, and he told them that power from on high would come on them. And at that point, he was received up into the heavens or the sky. Um, we don't have to believe, of course, that heaven is out there. So the going up into the air is really symbolic. What Jesus is saying, look, there's not going to be any further resurrected body appearances. You've now got to wait for some some other thing to come, not thing, but person. The Holy Spirit is going to come on and give you power. You're going to get power from on high. The other comforter that he promised them would come instead of him. They wouldn't need him to make bodily 
resurrection appearance anymore. So I just put that final comment. You've just got to wait now, Pete. And uh, so he did. Well, it's not always easy to just wait. And we all know that and wait for God to give us something or to call us to something. But that's where it's left at this stage with Pete. Now, I've only taken this up, of course, to uh, the stage where Jesus ascends to heaven. Uh, maybe in some future time I might take up the story of Peter, Peter going from Pentecost to his position in the early, early church. But that's his part, really, in the Easter story. Um, he's a very fallible person. Um, he's a bit of a blunderer. He's a bit of a blusterer. Uh, but he's the one that Jesus chose to lead the early church, not to build his church on Peter, but to be a leader in the early church together with James and John. Just one other thing to mention, and that is that sometimes people think that uh, disciples like Andrew, well, they didn't really do very much. You know, OK, we remember he brought Simon Peter to Jesus and he brought a young lad with fish to Jesus. And, and he's he's the one that just brings people to Jesus. So if you want to be an Andrew, what you've got to do to take people along to a meeting. Well, actually, it seems from church traditions that Andrew played quite a high part in early church evangelism, traveling out towards the Black Sea and around that whole area. Area That may be why we don't read much about him in the early part of Acts. He was off on a missionary tour. And some of the other disciples too, again, I've heard it so we never hear about this person, Sadduus or anything. But actually, there are early church traditions which seem to show that they went as far as India, there seems to be, I mentioned earlier, the five loaves and, and the two fish, there seems to be a brass bowl from the first century in China, um, which shows a picture of that, which seems a bit of a coincidence. It's not to do with Christianity reaching China, even in the first century. And certainly we can't assume that because the Acts focuses particularly on Paul and to some extent on Peter and John, that the other disciples did nothing. They didn't. They were, were very active. But Peter was chosen as a leader. And uh, now he just has to wait for the power from on high.